Explore exactly what it takes to become a successful day trader and the power of consistency from the minds of the trading's elite. This is the Beyond the PDT podcast. Here are your hosts, Bryce Tui and Matthew Monaco. Welcome back, traders. This is episode 18 of the Beyond the PDT podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Matthew Monaco, and in this episode, we interview Joe Callaway, who's also known as Golf and Stocks on Twitter. Joe is a full-time OTC trader, but unlike some of our previous guests who traded OTC stocks, including Dom, Jack, and Kyle, Joe's strategy is completely unique and focuses a lot around OTC promotions, which have died out in the last couple of the years, but the ones that still remains, Joe is able to deduct which ones are going to run before they're ever promoted or they run through his fundamental research. It's a pretty wild strategy and I don't want to spoil too much. So before we start this episode, make sure you subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to this on and let's dive right into this episode with Joe. Joe, welcome to the show. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself before we get too far in, just like who you are and how you discovered trading maybe? Yeah, so uh, thanks for having me on. I'm uh, 29 years old. I started trading two years ago, actually when I started going for my MBA. And originally I was just kind of like, all right, this is something fun to do, like just make a couple bucks on the side. And originally I wanted to get into wealth management. That's why I was going for my MBA. But over the course of my two year program, I was like, I kind of like trading a little bit more. <laughs> so I started trading just basically OTC stuff, but I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I joined a couple of discord rooms and I kind of just floundered around for a little bit. And I met a guy in one room and he taught me how to trade penny stocks pretty well. Uh, he's on Twitter. His name's like Ulysses two one, one, two, a really good buddy of mine. But, um, my trading never really changed much until I met this guy called Blake, and this was last May, and that's kind of how I got really into the OTC market and learning how to trade. Um, now, up until that point, I was working as a commercial or as a credit analyst at a commercial bank underwriting loans, and for anybody who knows about that, it's really boring. <laughs> it's, it's just a job to have, and it was fine for the time being, but I just wasn't into it, so... Went from an MBA, and then I'm like, you know what? I want to try trading. So I had actually had three shoulder surgeries last year, and I got to the point where trying to go to work and rehab it while going to school, and that was too much. So um, I left my job last February to just focus on going to school and rehab and kind of trade when I can. I wasn't really full-time then. It was more just for me to just focus on rehab and going to school. So I took more classes at school, and I kind of considered myself a full-time student at that point, if you want to say. Um, but then come September, I started working for my dad's company because I didn't have a ton of money saved up to just kind of just do whatever. And then it was at that point where uh, this guy, Blake, and his research and him teaching me, that's when I had this huge win. Um, it was actually – it's kind of funny but not funny, so – I know you guys had Kyle Williams on previously, and he likes to short those overextended uh, OTC runners and OTC promos. So his biggest loss at PTA was my biggest gain. Um, I wound up making up like 42 grand off that PTA. And that was at the point where I was like, all right, I can do this for real. Like I believe in myself, I can do this. And that's kind of where I started from. So as of last October, I've been full-time trading. Um, I do both OTCs and penny stocks, but primarily OTC is where I make most of my money. We'll have to mention to Kyle that even though he took a bit of a hit on it, uh, you, uh, <laughs> that's really what kind of got you into the game. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, um, I mean, he's got a great strategy. Honestly, his strategy now is great because the SEC and FINRA, they're really cracking down on OTC promos and anything that looks fishy. So like I saw his V6 short, his CL, um, CI short, that's great. I'm actually in the process of opening up a Venom account so I can short them because right, right now it favors the shorters versus the longs. He's having a pretty killer month right now. He's in like BEAG, uh, VCEX, and like BKIT, which are all like OTC promos. And he's been, uh, this yep. month he's been crushing it. So are you primarily like longing these OTC pumps? Is that like kind of how you got started? Like what's your style and just approach to that? Yeah, so um, I haven't really actually shorted anything until recently. 
uh, when I joined E-Trade to short um, just penny stocks. But yeah, so what I mainly do is this guy that I met that I met in the chat room called Blake, he's been trading for 10 years and he's been doing these OTC promos the entire time. And he taught me how to spot them, how to research them, how to trade them. So like, for example, FPTA, uh, we saw it getting walked down from like $7 down to like a buck 20, a buck 30. So we started buying it there and I got about 15 grand in at about a buck 50 average and they started promoting it and I sold too soon because we don't know how high it's going to go. So I sold around like five, I think five sixty, five seventy average and then it went to like 850, which was crazy. But um, yeah, so basically what we do is I research with him and we kind of spot these promos and other stocks too that go off or before they go off and we just kind of play them to the long side. Um, I know I was talking with Matt about DCDG. So basically all these OTC promos for the go off, everything's in the filings. The thing is no one really knows what to look for. And I didn't know what to look for until I met this guy. So I always knew DCDG was a good level setup for where it was. And I was betting that for months actually. I had like I had five hundred dollars in it at like dub thirty. And a buddy Nick had I think six hundred dub thirty. And I had a what happened was I had to sell a week before it like supernova because I was switching from TOS to E-Trade and I was just like, all right, I'm like, whatever, I'll just sell it. I'll buy it back later. And I couldn't buy it back later because then it went off. But, um, yeah, we basically just long them and that's how we made our, that's how I made my money. But like I said, recently the SEC has been cracking down on promos. So I'm trying to open up a Venom account so I can also get the short side as well. Yeah. Just so the listeners know, dub 30 as in like, point zero zero three zero right yes yeah very cheap below a penny yeah below (laughs) a penny and i think on friday dc dg closed at like 30 cents or something so that's i don't even know what's that a thousand times on your money (laughs) yeah (laughs) had you with a help yeah i mean i know there was a couple guys who were in it and i think some of them held to like 20 cents or something like that or 15 cents and they had a lot of amounts in like 100 200 dollars but they still did really well but yeah, these, that's the thing. You don't know how high these are going to go and how long they're going to go because it's just, you don't know. But yeah, it's, it's an insane game. It's unreal. <laughs> so quick question. I'm, I'm pretty curious. So you're, alert, you know, you're spotting, um, you're spotting OTC pump and dumps. Do you have a, you know, a set risk if, if it doesn't get promoted, if it keeps continuing to fall or how does, you know, I'm assuming you're trying to get in as close to the bottom as you can, but you're also getting in before it's pumped. So What's kind of your, do you have a risk set in mind most times? Or can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, typically, so these stocks, they're not designed to make retail money. Like not many people can spot these before they go off. So they'll try to fake people out, like act like it's going to go off and bring it back down. Um, luckily, for the most part, I've never been in a position where I've had to just get out before the promotion starts. Normally, if I'm down, like, I mean, I was down, what was it? And one stock, I was down like 50% for a month and then they send it off thankfully <laughs> but uh if if it gets to the point where i just know they won't promote it then i'll get out but i don't get in setups unless i pretty much know they're going to go off or have a reasonably good just intuition that they're going to go off i should say but um you yeah, know i've never been in that position thankfully hopefully not ever but we'll see <laughs> and so, so i'm assuming you're using relatively small size to you know starting off with these to get in for that reason because you don't know how far down they're going to go yeah, exactly. Um, like FPTA, I was in for, I think, like two grand just to see what would happen because sometimes they might bring it down below a dollar, but they didn't for this case. And then when they started to uptick it, that was my signal to be like, all right, I think they might start it from here. So I just started buying more. But yeah, I mean, it's a possibility. They just, they just don't promote it. So that's, it's could, could happen, but hopefully not. <laughs> it's kind of blowing my mind a little bit here just because you know, like there's been some really good people, uh, famous traders like Tim Grittani and who's got started with these OTC promotions. But I haven't really heard a lot of people talk about longing them in recent years just because of all the crackdown of the SEC, which you mentioned a little bit. So like on your take, like, do you think it's really risky still? And do would you would you recommend new people start this or is this like a really advanced strategy and you don't want to see a lot of people, you know, <laughs> scoop in and buy these risky possible promos? Yeah, so it's funny. I actually watched a bunch of Gratani's videos when I first started doing this stuff because he was trading this, and it's kind of cool to see how he did it. 
I'd say in this last year, I would say going long was worth it. This year, until the market changes, I would say going short is better because it seems like within two to three days, they slap the CE on it and then the stock just gaps down overnight and it's just done. So, like, I mean, I should have started off with this. Pretty much almost every OTC stock is an insider enrichment scheme and the insiders are just looking to make money any way they can to just pump up the share price. So whether it's a subby like DCDG or if it's something over a buck like FPTA, they'll come up with some bogus PR or a change of control or a merger, and that'll be the catalyst to send it. But at the end of the day, I would say right now, it's better to be short side. Because actually, so I actually was long V6 at 60 cents because I saw it trading pretty much when it it started trading because we did research on it. And I think I did 60 cents to about I think I sold 118 was when I sold it. I made like maybe one or two grand, not much, because I didn't trust going long. And then my buddy shorted it from like, I think two bucks, something like that. But yeah, I would say going short right now is more favorable. I wouldn't recommend going long. It's, I'm actually having, I've strayed away from going trading promos so much. I more tend to go to the lower price ones, like the DCDGs or um, like, for example, RBW. So we look for good setups that are in the subby realm. So I call subbies anything under one cent. So if they have a good setup, like a DCDG setup, we'll get in. So RB&W, I knew it was a, high, it was a pretty high-level setup. And it was trading around dub 50 at the time. So I tried to get as many shares as I could, but I couldn't get that many. So I wound up getting, I think, $700 worth. And my buddy Nick got pretty much the same amount. And we held it for like two months. And then an AK came out pre-market saying they... They changed their operations to MJ because that's what everyone's doing these days to make everything moon. But they changed the marijuana, ticker symbol changes coming, and a whole new business direction. And it gapped up to like two cents, and we made like 600% overnight. So we kind of tend more towards those plays now. And then we also tend to look at pot stocks at lows. So um, it was funny. I was listening to your interview with Dom the other day, and he was talking about POTN and stuff like that. So pot stocks like to run in the fall in the winter time and during the summertime is when they usually sell off and that's when you kind of look to like get a starter position kind of like ease in so i actually played po i played buds from 55 cents to like 65 cents the other day and i'm right now i'm looking at potn again hemp buds for more so like right now i say for beginners i look at the pot stocks at lows and pretty much anything that has a good catalyst like a change of control or reverse merger stuff like that i would not look at OTC promos at the moment just because right now there's it's better to be short side not long side there now a quick question about like before we go too far off from the OTC promos because that is where you've had some success like you said before the SEC has kind of been cracking down on them you keep you know you mentioned that um you know this when the setup presents itself what kind of setup and you don't need to go too far in detail but what is the setup what kind of stuff do you look for for an OTC promo on the long side so we, we check through the filings a lot, um, kind of see who the people are involved. It's, I can't go too much into detail because it's not my information to share. It's my buddy Blake's. But uh, look at the share structure. Look at the debt. Um, we, we just basically want to make sure they're not going to dilute into any run. And if they have, if it's a hot sector, so like marijuana, crypto when it was hot, stuff like that. So we kind of take the whole picture into account. And we make sure like the chart doesn't have a lot of baggies. So what I mean by baggies is it hasn't had a run and sold off and there's not a lot of overhanging resistance. So we kind of look for all that for a run. And another thing is we also look for, so whenever tickers get diluted down to like trip zero, if you guys ever seen that before, uh, what they do is they'll typically do a reverse split and they'll sometimes do a name change. So people kind of forget about the tickers past and whatnot. And what happens is they'll usually reverse split and then they'll, I, it doesn't matter, like they'll wind up anywhere from like 10 cents, to like 50 cents post reverse split. They'll sell off, establish a base. And that's kind of what we look for, too, because those post reverse split tickers, they'll, they're normally good for issuing like one or two PRs. And they'll kind of like send it really hard on that smaller share structure. So it's basically that share structure, who is involved, overhang resistance, if any, and looking at the debt to make sure it's not too dilutive so it can run. And that's pretty much the formula. Gotcha. And how do you like pick your price targets on kind of those promo ones versus, you know, just 
dip buying your marijuana like buds and stuff. Uh, how does your approach differ for those two different styles? So for the promos, it's uh, it's a little more going off of what similar promos have done in the past. So um, like for FPTA, we always thought it would go to like six or eight dollars, but we don't like staying in a promo too long because every day long you stay in it, there's more risk of it being shorted or the SEC cracking down on it. That's why we sold it. As far as like uh, dip buying buds and stuff, usually those are good for like 100% run. Uh, sometimes it might do like a perk, pull back a little bit and then go. So like with buds, buds went from, we were looking at it at 50 cents and I got in like 54 cents and the 50 MA. So these pot stocks really respect the moving averages, like the 200 and the 50 MA. So this perked over the 50 MA, which is at 68 cents. And then it came back down and closed at 59 cents. So right now we're looking at like probably a 55 to 62 cent range grab and then have it go to a dollar. So, um, yeah, these like, so it's like buds, POTN, TRTC, L buy, all those. They're normally good for like one to 200% runs off lows and then they'll sell off some more. But for the promos, it's kind of just kind of feeling it out, seeing how past promotions have done and kind of applying it to ones in the future that have similar share structures and whatnot. So it's not an exact science. It's more like an art, um, but it's, we just tweak it over time. You're trying to shy away a little bit from pump and dumps right now because of the SEC cracking down on them and you're playing a lot of dip buying marijuana stocks. Are you, you know, at all looking into going into NASDAQ a little bit more or is that not something that you're really uh, thinking about right now? Just out of curiosity. So I actually, I should have said this from the beginning. I trade more penny stocks in the summertime. And my OTC primarily is done for dip buying pot stocks and then looking at um, like EVCCs, uh, Tomy, stuff like that, and DCDGs, like kind of looking at those plays, but those plays don't happen a lot. So like, for example, this past week I played RVLT, which went from like 27 cents, to like almost a dollar. I'd scalp those. I don't really swing penny stocks. I more kind of look at the runs of the day and I get in on dip buys and just kind of scalp them. Because for it's funny, I feel more comfortable holding OTC overnight versus penny stocks because you don't have a risk of like an offering coming. I mean, there is an offering sometimes, but like there's really I, I'm aware of what can happen in OTC stock. And it's a lot less riskier swinging those versus a penny stock, which can do a reverse split and offering or just have like bad news overnight. So like right now I'm playing like the RBLTs. I played um, I played Yuma. I played CEI. So I don't go like I don't make as much money off them as I do OTC because I trust my OTC research more, but I still scout the penny runs of the day. And do you really do you have a strategy for that that, you know, is it literally just dip buying? Is it, you know, getting in on a dip or do you have a in-depth strategy for the penny stocks you play? Uh for penny stocks, so for reverse split tickers, normally you gotta watch them and they're normally good for one or two PRs about anywhere from two to five days after reverse split, if not the first day. So that's kind of feeling it out. But for dip buying, um, it's kind of, it seems kind of basic, but I go off RSI, honestly. I go off RSI and then the intraday chart. So like for RBLT, it like moon to like, I think, I think it halted at like, it went to all the way to 91 cents and it came down and I bought it off the dip because of RSI. And it's, it seems really basic, but that's what I do. And that's what it works for me. And then, of course, I use VWAP and kind of go off that. But, yeah, I like using, using RSI. And then on the daily chart, um, so something that runs once post-reverse split is normally good to run a couple more times. So something that I've found works really well is using the ADMA on the daily chart. And this works both for OTC and NASDAQ runners. So if something gets starts selling off, I'll look to get back in on, around the ADMA. And right around there is where it's usually good for a bounce spot. So that's kind of what I do for the NASDAQ runners. These OTC runners, like, like you say these, there's these like breadcrumbs basically in the filings um, for pre-promo and stuff. So those ones are the ones you're comfortable to swing on. Do you play anything else in OTC and swing them? Like, you know, like some of the other OTC traders we have, like Dom and Jack, they, you know, basically strictly are just looking for these breakout type plays on PRs. Do you, are you also a fan of those or is that totally outside your realm of what you're looking to do in the OTC market? Oh no, I play those too. I like them a lot. Um, I just don't size them as much because you can't size them as much really. But I mean, they're good for a couple grand. Like actually, 
it's funny. I was, when I was listening to Dom's uh, interview, I did this, a very similar thing where if something has a PR and it's running really well in high volume, I'll buy into it like a couple minutes before close and then sell on the gap up. So I love doing that strategy. Um, you're not going to make a ton doing that, but like it's a way to just make consistent gains over time. But yeah, I mean, if something's like around one or two pennies and it comes out with like a reverse merger or like a contract PR with Amazon or Walmart, yeah, I love playing those plays. And it's, that's kind of what I look for. And it's great because I use equity feed and I also use a, a, a service called OTC re re dot com, and that gets filings and, and any um, officer change or amendment or merge in. Like I see it there before anything else, and that's honestly how I see everything before most people. So by the time a lot of people on Twitter see it, I'm already in it, and that's kind of how I can make some decent money. So yeah, I love doing that. What they do too, I do that as well. I just didn't really talk about it much because the promos is how I kind of became full time, but I also trade those as well. So going back a little bit about the pumps that you play for OTC, those are pretty heavily based on the filings and whatnot. When you play other OTC movers or even just, you know, penny stocks, are you looking as much into the filings or I know you mentioned a lot of the NASDAQ plays you do are tactical based, but what about the other OTC stuff? Are you looking into filings and whatnot or not nearly as much? I still look into them because so like the promos that Gritani and Tim Sykes played back in the day, after they run for a little bit and they get promoted, they'll just sell off into like below a penny. And a common thing what the insiders do is they'll try to milk the shells again. So they'll repump them with some like kind of bogus PR. So if I see something get news pre-market, I'll check the filings. I'll see if it's, got, if it's a connected ticker, if there's somebody like big in it. And if there is, that's when I'm like, okay, this could probably be something. So I still check the filings regardless. But – um. The main ones that we check a lot are the big promos. But yeah, I mean, if something sub a penny or around one or two pennies gets news and it's like, and it's pretty connected ticker, then yeah, I'm going to take some. Like, uh, you had KBLB go from, I think, what, five cents to like 50 cents. And that's, that was a connected ticker. And I saw that, at, and we were playing that around 12 cents. So even though something might not be like the ultimate A plus high level setup, we can still check the filings. And yeah, I check them for everything just to make sure we cover all the bases because you never know. Someone could rip like, like DCDG could rip like a hundred thousand percent. You just never know. Now, a well, couple of questions. Maybe they're connected. When you say connected ticker, what do you mean by that first? And then secondly, how do you know someone's big in it? Is that totally based on the filings or is this something you see, you know, on the tape through buying or, or the vol- volume throughout the day? Uh, oh yeah. So I should have, clarify that so when i say something big in it i don't mean position size wise i just mean like um name wise from the filing something like that and then connected ticker could be like you could have this like someone in in this ticker be the same be like he like someone in one ticker could be involved with multiple other tickers so say for example you had someone this is i had no idea if this happened i'm just saying for uh hypothetical purposes say if you had one guy in dcdg and you saw it went to like 36 cents. And say you see news pre-market for another ticker at like dub 30 with that same guy involved, you can be like, all right, it might be a connected ticker because the same guy is in both filings. So it might run a similar pattern to it. So that's kind of what I mean by connected. Some shady shit going on there down in the OTC markets. Uh, very <laughs> shady. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, what is your stance on, like, a lot of people um, are like, the OTC market's dying out. It's it's not like what it was, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago. And the SEC cracked down on all these promos that were, you know, huge and how a lot of the big names today kind of got started. You know, you trade this daily. Is it dying out, do you think? Or is it just kind of changed? It's a different market than once it was, than what it was a couple of years ago. And it's still, like, viable. Like, clearly, you can make money in it. Yeah, so when my buddy Blake was trading back in the day, he was like literally every week there was like thousand percent gainers, and he said it was like uh, taking candy from a baby. But now, I'd say the market goes in cycles. I mean, everything works in cycles. So right now, uh, the OTC market's kind of dead. Like, I mean, it's summer, so generally the OTC market's slower in the summertime, and it picks up in the fall and the winter. So uh, I mean, with the OTC cracking down now, yeah, it's definitely a different landscape, and I think it's going to change at some point. But right now it's dead. But I'd say come fall and winter time, it should pick up, pick back up again. 
granted, will we see it to the effect of when Gratani and Sykes were trading back in the day when everything was just going really hard? Maybe not, but things will get better. I just, you just need some time for them to cool off. That's all. Now, do you think there's a possibility that the market, the OTC market could be like that again and say, you know, five years or so, maybe when regulations change or something, or is it kind of just, you know, the OTC markets found where it's going to be. And a lot of people are now just focused on these NASDAQ runners and you're not so sure if the volume can come back to the OTC land. No, I think that's possible. So what, uh, I mean, I don't have experience with this. This is coming from my, my buddy, but he said back when the recession hit, that's when a lot of the OT stocks just started flying because in a recession, no one really makes money. So the SEC is not going to care as much uh, for stocks flying versus when everyone's making money like we are now. So like say if the market goes on a downturn or not being political, but say if we get a Democrat in office and they enact changes that would adversely affect the economy, anything that would cause the market to have a downturn, it's only going to help the OTC market to allow the SEC just to like let more stuff go off. So, I mean, it could happen like in 2020, 2021, you never know. Um, I will say right now that my buddy has never seen the OTC this slow and this bad as far as crackdowns go. But the more that they crack down now means potentially the easier it could be in the future. I'm just speaking hypothetically, but I think it could get better. Possibly that point where it was in the past, but you never know. So, and I have a question kind of going based off what we were talking about earlier and how, you know, right now you're not looking to long uh, promos as much. You said you do want to start shorting them. Is, uh, is that correct? Uh, yeah. Do you, is it kind of going to be like along the same lines? I should technically, I guess, be a little bit easier if you can start doing that. You'll know when the promo is kind of starting to go to an end. Are you going to look to kind of use the same uh, mindset that Kyle uses that we had talked earlier? You know, as soon as you you see the pump is over, you're just going to try to hop in as much as possible? Or what's your plan to start doing that? Actually, I like Kyle's strategy a lot. So my he uses, um, I forget what, he, what broker he uses, but I was going to use Venom. And Venom is not, they don't get shares preferentially. So it's thing, they, so they get it from, it goes IB, then Cobra, then I think Venom. So it's like the last in the line. But Venom has the least amount of minimum equity required. So I think it's like six grand is the minimum money required to start up a Venom account. So I don't want to start up with too much for shorting. So I was going to do like probably 10 grand. And yeah, I would kind of ease in the position and kind of just feel it out. But yeah, once the CE hits, for a promo stock, it's pretty much always a death sentence. So at open, when it gaps down, just start shorting it. And that's kind of where you can go in hard and heavy. And like, if I would have shorted, I would have done exactly what Kyle did. Like short V6 around like the 120 area and just cover below like 50 cents. So that's kind of where my head's at with that. So it, it should be, actually, it should be pretty simple, quote unquote, if they keep it that way for the environment. But I mean, you never know. They could put a CE on it and then they just squeeze the stock. So... But I would say that's the way I would go for shorting stocks, definitely, how he does it. So could you explain what CE means to the listeners? Like, you know, who assigns it? And, you know, it means a death sentence for a stock, you said. But, like, technically speaking, like, from the authorities, you know, what is a CE? So a CE is called a caveat emptor. And it's placed on a stock where there could be a number of reasons. So they could be saying one thing and it means something else. Um, there's also, they can put a C on for promotional activity. That's illegal. So promoting a stock is, is legal. What's not legal is wash trading. So if they find tickers doing that, they'll put a CE on them. If someone's getting indicted or if they're, if they find shady stuff going on, they'll put a CE on it. And it's basically, it says to like the normal people, normal retail, like, all right, this stock we think is, is a risk to normal investors. So you shouldn't avoid it. And most people won't touch a CE stock for rightful reasons. And that mark alone will cause people in it to just sell it. So that kind of like causes the avalanche of selling. And then when you pile on the shorters, that kind of just tanks the stock price completely. So it's more just a warning being like, all right, you guys shouldn't touch this stock. You can still trade stocks that have a CE, but most people won't touch them. Interesting. This is all news to me, honestly. I'm not, I know Matt, you know a bit more about OTC the OTC market in general than I do, but this I'm learning a lot from this right now. So one thing I was I meant to ask, are you worried about not worried, I guess, but it's definitely gonna be a change because the the promos that you're playing, you like you said, you can make 600, 700, 800 percent on them. When you're shorting them, obviously the most you can make is 
you know, you can't make over 100%. Are you going to have to kind of change the way that you exit your positions to, or maybe size into them to get larger gains? Do you have any plans around that yet? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I'm going to have to go in, like, so my buddy shorts them now, and he goes in pretty hard and heavy from the get-go. And he looks for, like, he doesn't hold much overnight just because you never know what's going to happen. But he'll look for, like, anywhere from 20 to 30 or 40%. But he goes in with like 50, 60 grand. Granted, I don't have like I don't have that much money to allocate to a shorting account. But yeah, I would have to pretty much go all in and kind of hold for like anywhere from 25 to 50 percent, which is possible. I mean, you have these stocks CE and then just gapping down like continually until they get down to like 10 to 20 cents. Um, like CLCI, it went up to I think it squeezed like 280, and then now it's trading around like 30 cents. So if you get in that first day after the CE and just hold it for the sell-off and just kind of wait a couple of days, you can make a decent amount of money. So, yeah, I mean, right now, if I do it, I have to go in, like, pretty much with my whole account if I, when I open it up and just kind of hold to, for more downside. I, I mean, personally, I've been looking into it a little bit just because I talk to Kyle. And, you know, I try to trade uh, OTCs long. And, again, this summer, it's just been very slow in the OTC market from the long standpoint. But he just... Every month, you know, continuously crushes it with like two or three, uh, two or three promos, and he just gets in short them usually before the CE, but then after the CE, you know, he piles in, and the gains on those dumps are could be absolutely ridiculous. Like fifty percent is not the question at all, even on the first day that you get the CE. Well, and honestly, if I mean, shorting in my opinion, these pumps, not to say long you can't make money, but it's just when you know most of the time. Again, like you said, when the short comes it's normally that's kind of the end of it so i'm not saying it's less risky but from my understanding it does seem a little bit i guess safer but i hate saying that word you know what i mean oh no you're right though i mean it is safer because i mean in this market like nine times out of ten if, when you start shorting it there's a good possibility that's going to get slapped by the ce or just like i mean honestly like if you just check to see if shorts are available like from the day they start becoming available is a day when you should actually start looking to short it because that's pretty much where close to the top is. Like, I think for V6, shorts became available around 150, I think. And it hit like two bucks and then it tanked. So if you started in like 160, 170 area and risked off $2, you would have been fine. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is safer because right now you could short anything, it seems, that's getting promoted and make out. But like I said, I mean, nothing's safe in the market. But relatively speaking, yes, going short is safer than going long at the moment. A hundred percent. No, I mean, I was just going to say, you know, you, you've got a relatively unique strategy. Like it caught my interest a lot. It was very unique and some huge gains possibilities. But in general, do you have any like tips for beginners, people who are newer in their journey? Because your journey only really got going, you said, like about a year ago now when you started finding some consistency. So what are some tips that you could just give out to those people who maybe are on the verge of consistency or just finally starting to become consistent to help them take their trading to the next level and possibly become full-time uh, like you are? Uh, so I'd say two things. I'd say track everything. So by tracking, I mean like tracking your P&L and seeing what works and what doesn't work. So like I have an Excel spreadsheet where every day I track how much I made or I lost, um, my total account value, and then any notes for anything I did. Like what worked, what didn't work, what could I do better? Um, and then the other big thing is um, you should, I mean, it's if you look at my Twitter page, I don't really tweet a whole lot recently, and there's a reason for that. It's because uh, I feel like for OTC market, people talk about um, – I don't know if you guys know this, but they'll try to contact the CEO for updates. Um, they think following the company's Twitter page will help them. But really, if you spend more time learning how to read a balance sheet and learning how to read filings and understanding what's really going on behind the scenes, that's how you can figure out what's going on, and that's what really made – the OTC market a lot more simpler for me and why I prefer trading over the regular NASDAQ listed exchange. But yeah, it's um, just track it and try to do your research and having a finance background helps for the balance sheet, obviously, but anyone can learn that. But yeah, that's pretty much what I recommend. I guess if you were to start it all over, right? Start over with a new $2,000 account or for someone who's out there who only has a $2,000 account, what would you recommend their trading approach be? Uh, obviously, you're heavily uh, invested in the OTC market. So how would you grow this $2,000 account into eventually an account where that you can go full-time as a trader? I would only look for, so 
for people starting out, they're not going to know how to spot these OTC promos, obviously. But um, if you're training the OTC, I look for um, I like pot breakouts. Pot stock breakouts are really good. Um, but for subby realms, something with good news like a merger or a change of control or like a contract. So like all last year, it was like oh we had a contract with Amazon or Walmart, and it's just a bogus PR, but that's what sends stuff like multiple hundreds of percent. So for me, like for a new person, I like the OTC over the NASDAQ because it's a lot easier to see quicker gains if you know how to play them right. So as long as people can realize what companies are good and look at the share structure, make sure it's decent. Like my buddy, Nick, he grew his account from, I think he started with five grand and now he's like at uh, 70 grand. And that's after taking out like 10 months worth of expenses for trading full time. And all he did was uh, look at stuff with good catalysts um, and the right volume to support enough money to get into the trades. So that's kind of where I would recommend people starting with. And once you start snowballing your account, that's when you kind of can take more size. And that's when you can kind of just start um, just getting to dip buying too. Because I think dip buying for someone right out of the gate is, is pretty hard to master. Definitely. I can attest to that. Uh, not the best dip buyer in the world, that's for sure. I think it's funny that a lot of people just start in NASDAQ and penny stocks because, you know, that's what's marketed to them. That's what they see on YouTube and stuff. But, you know, when you talk to the traders that trade OTC over NASDAQ, I mean, it, the OTC market is just much simpler than the NASDAQ market. You know, there's less players. You aren't necessarily fighting the algorithms or the hedge funds or whoever is in the NASDAQ market. I mean, the, it, like the OTC market, I want to use the word simpler, like, there's just less factors you have to consider and you almost can just solely base all your trades on technical analysis and in the OTC market, it can, it can work for you. Yeah, I agree completely. I mean, I mean, if you take a look at an OTC stocks uh, balance sheet, it's most likely crap, Like, there's nothing to it. So I generally just go off technicals and that's what's the great thing about it. Cause I mean, I know Dom was talking about how you have to look at the cash position if they might do an offering overnight. And I agree. I mean, like, if you hold a penny stock overnight, especially one of the runners of the day, there's always a risk of an offering. But with OTC, like there's really no risk of an offering or anything. So it's it's just much simpler to me. And not that trading is easy, but trading OTC is easier for me than trading penny stocks. Very well said. I like that. Now, so going forward in the future, you know, you're talking about maybe just starting to begin shorting the pumper or the the promotion stocks for OTCs. Do you have any other kind of plans moving forward that you know, you want to start in your trading or maybe even just in your life? I'd say the shorting is probably the biggest aspect I'm missing out on because going long is great, but missing the short side, it's like missing half of a potential trade. So I think once I can start shorting it, especially now, because I know what stocks are going to be promoted for the most part is when I can really start taking off profit wise. Um, as far as going forward, um, I'm just taking stuff day by day at the moment. Like I started trading full time last October so, I mean, I'm coming up on a year soon. So I'm just right now, I'm just trying to just continually to be profitable and just kind of work on sizing more. So if I can size more in the penny stock realm, not necessarily OTC, but that's kind of the next step, shorting promos and sizing more on the OTC run, or the NASDAQ runners of the day. That's kind of where I think I can really, I can really kind of accelerate my growth, so to speak. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, I have an MBA that I'm not going to use at the moment, but <laughs> if, uh, if for some reason trading isn't working out, I have that to fall back on, but I'm pretty confident that I'll be okay. So that's kind of my game plan going forward. Great stuff. And I mean, you kind of blew my mind a little bit here that you can actually long some of these OTC promos before they even, they come out with the promo. That's, that's pretty wild. If you have any, like, you know, any last words, last advice or tips for the listeners, um, I mean, that'd be absolutely great too. Yeah, actually a big one that I learned early in my career was, don't trust anyone blindly. So if you're in a trade that someone else is really big on, even if like, and you go against your gut, I would say trust your gut because it's better to miss profits than to take a loss. So what I should have mentioned before is my biggest loss, I lost 22 grand on IMPX, a penny stock, because I was in a chat room and one of the traders was huge on it. And he was like, yo, this thing's going to supernova. The technicals are aligned. It's all great. It's whatever. So like, he was really big on it. And I was like, all right, I trust him because, like, he's made really great calls before. But that was when I was new, didn't know anything, and I trusted him, and I wound up taking a huge loss. So even if 
I mean, I've learned a lot since then. That was like a year plus ago. But I say the biggest thing is just even if you're just starting out, I'd say trust your gut and sit out on a trade versus potentially get in and take a loss if you don't trust it. I've been yeah. there before. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a fun Definitely. place. We all do. I mean, when you're a beginner, though, like you think you just all these other people know more than you. And it's a very common fault for new people just to blindly trust someone. But it's definitely one of the worst things you can do. Yep. Agree. Great advice. Uh, I think that's a great thing to end on there. Uh, that's all we had. It was awesome talking to you. And I, I love your side of trading just, you know, because it's totally different than most people. And very different style. I like it, though. I didn't even know it still existed. That's what and that's what blew my mind so much. But that's pretty cool. I mean, you can make money anywhere in the stock market with almost any strategy. And I mean, that's pretty badass. Yeah, that's the great thing about it. But uh, thanks for you guys having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much, man. Have a great, um, well, actually, hopefully a great week trading. Hopefully we can get some OTC runners, right? <laughs> yeah, thanks. You too, guys. <laughs> yeah, take it easy. What's up, everyone? It's Matt again, and thanks for listening to the entire episode with Joe. As usual, if you have any questions, recommendations, or concerns for us, please check us out at beyondthepdt.com, and make sure you check out the recap blog post, which comes every Friday after we launch our episodes. If you did not do so in the beginning, I would like to ask you to please subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you're listening to it on. Leave us a review as it helps us out a ton. And besides that, I can't wait to catch you guys next week on episode 19.